openly waiting. I'm having to use a touchscreen computer and it's not working. Very well. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything. <laughs> that we do, including educating our friends who are social workers and nurses, which is you all. Thank you for joining us today. It's Friday the 13th. Let's hope it's a lucky Friday the 13th for all of us. Thank you for joining us on what I bet is a busy day for you just because of the day or date itself and day that it's on, Friday the 13th. I um, appreciate y'all for all that you do. Today, we're bringing you something a little different than what we often do uh, in terms of our education, which is uh, uh, something new and something that is delivered by a colleague of ours and yours, someone who has listened to Care Concierge Education herself for a couple of years and has offered to share her expertise with us for which we are most valuable. So we're joined today by social worker, Holly Skelly, and she'll introduce herself later, but I'm so pleased that she had the, the interest in, uh, in uh, sharing her expertise because it is a topic which is dear to me and I bet dear to many of you who've joined us here today, which is animals. And in this case, in Holly's case, she's gonna discuss with us animal assisted therapy or therapies and this i think is something uh that will be most interesting and a wonderful way to spend what is otherwise at least in birmingham a sort of overcast and gray friday now if any of you are listening in any areas that were affected by the storms yesterday and last night and there is loss of life in your community or god forbid in your family we uh, we uh, are happy to uh, have you. Wait, is anyone seeing what? It's a security alert screen. Every that's when that's what we're seeing on your screen. Is it in addition to the uh, screen, or just in, instead of? Instead, I think instead of. That's so weird. Let me uh, see if we can. Uh, I'll try and, about the Holly, security. why don't you introduce yourself and let me see if I can fix the technology. Um, stop share. I'm sorry, everybody, for the technical difficulties. I thought my by doing this on my work computer that it would be flawless because I have to use Zoom all the time. And of course, nothing is working. <laughs> is uh, Is it still on there? No, I just see you now as the like main screen. Oh gosh. Go away. What do you see now, me? Just you. Okay, now let's try to go back to share screen. We've gotten rid of the, uh, what do we call the uh, good morning? Uh-huh. Okay, I'm sorry, y'all. Whenever you deal with Sean Barnes and technology, there we go. Now we see the power on having some issues. That's just mm -hmm. sort of my my cross to bear. I think is having issues. Why is this not working? Now we see the PowerPoint. There we go. Here we go. Okay. All right. Everyone, we, anybody seeing anything on the screen they don't want to see? <laughs> My photograph. No. <laughs> <laughs> Other than Holly and possibly me. Um, so let's pull up the chat room and make sure that everyone's doing well. 
So everyone, if you'll answer me in the chat room now that I can see it, please tell me if we need to uh, do anything else with the technology um, or if everything is fine. It looks good to me. All right. Now, I have placed in the chat room the survey tool. I will read it real quickly, and then we'll get on with things. It is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash uppercase c is in cat f is in frank h is in heaven x c is in cat v is in victory x lowercase m is in mary e is in edward the link is in the chat i'm about to hit it into the chat y'all there it is can you type survey as well caroline miss king yes there it is. Do y'all see it in the chat room? Yes, yes, yes. As you know, it's password protected. We'll give that out about 1250. And uh, you must do the evaluation to get credit for this contact hour. We are accredited by the Board of Nursing and the Board of Social Work for the state of Alabama. And it's our privilege and pleasure when we can get our technology to work to bring you <laughs> folks like today's Holly Skelly to share a very interesting topic with us. And so I will cede the floor finally to you, Holly, <laughs> okay. uh, and let you share with us your knowledge and experience. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate everybody uh, signing up to view this presentation today. I hope that it's um, informative. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Holly. Would you speak okay. up just a hair? Oh, I'll yeah. I was just saying, um, I, I appreciate everybody signing up for this presentation today, and I hope that it's informative, um, at least interesting on some level, and um, yeah, hope that it provides maybe a tool or a resource that you guys can use in your practice uh, afterwards. Um, so my name is Holly Skelly. I'm a social worker. Um, I currently work at the Mary Stark Harper Center in Tuscaloosa. Um, I've worked here for about three and a half years. I've been a social worker since 2015, and most of my work has been um, in mental health. Um, only really have worked geriatric psych since I've been here at the Harper Center. Um, but in addition to being a social worker, I um, volunteer with an organization uh, in, based in Birmingham called Hand and Paw. And we are an animal assisted therapy organization. We provide animal assisted interventions uh, to the communities in Birmingham and also in Tuscaloosa. Um, we serve a variety of populations, multiple different types of agencies, uh, and we have different kinds of animals in our organization. So um, I've been with Hand and Paw since 2013, I believe. Um, I've worked as a therapy pet handler. I've also served as a group facilitator for them, program facilitator. And I, in addition to having my own therapy dog and cat, um, I also serve as an evaluator for hand and paw. So I evaluate new teams that want to become uh, ther therapy teams. So um, I've had a couple of different roles in hand and paw and been with them a long time. Uh, so animals are a big, I'm a huge animal person and animal assisted therapy is really close to my heart and I've seen it be really beneficial on many occasions in a variety of um, situations. So I'm, I'm glad that you guys are all kind of interested in learning more about it. So um, I'm ready for the next slide. Okay. Um, actually, you can go to the third slide. Yeah, that's. That's, uh, you can go back to the second slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that was, that's a picture of me, that's my therapy dog, Abel. Um, uh, I tried not to put too many cutesy animal pictures in this presentation. Um, so I hope you guys don't get sick of seeing animal pictures, but there are there are a few, <laughs> so be <What>? prepared. <laughs> what, well, I'm sorry to interrupt, what is Abel, what breed? I have no idea. I think he's uh, maybe a basset hound mix. He's about 50 pounds and he's got itty bitty little legs. 
He um, looks, I was thinking Basset Hound or even maybe bull, little light bulldog of some sort. Yeah. And the vet uh, said beagle, but. <laughs> oh, be beagle? Be I could get beagle beagles. with the ears. <laughs> My daughter's so obsessed with her six month old now puppy. She got the DNA test done on it and it's a super mutt. Fifty <laughs> percent and super mutt is like fifty percent pit bull, so it's a super mutt oh. with pit bull and Norwegian hound, which I've never heard of. Oh, uh, but it, that, and she looks like that—the Norwegian hound. Oh, I need to look that up. Yeah, it's yeah. just—it's a smallish, smaller dog than you're thinking. A, uh, and it's not as hairy as you expect, but the nose is what makes. Oh, huh. I'll have I'm to look sorry, that up. That was a way aside point. Excuse me. Oh, that's okay. I'm ready for the next objectives. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically what I hope that you guys get from this presentation is um, the, the big, a big one for me is to be able to explain the difference between service animals, emotional support animals, and therapy animals. A lot of times people kind of get them all confused, but they are a very distinct um, types of working animals. Um, also, there are several different types of animal assisted activities. Animal, animal assisted therapy is the umbrella term that's used, but then it kind of divides up in different um, areas. So I hope to be able to provide a little more insight on that. Um, and I also hope that you guys are able to learn about all of the benefits that animals can bring um, to hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, jails, group homes, um, young people, old people. Um, we're just going to talk a little bit about all the benefits, both for physical and emotional health that, you know, animal interacting with animals can bring. Next slide. Yes. So as I said, um, before I get into uh, more information, I like to kind of discuss the difference between a service dog an emotional support dog, and a therapy dog. Um, sometimes I think of them as kind of a spectrum, but they, they really are, they have similarities, but they also have a lot of differences. So um, I usually start with service dogs. Um, those are the, you know, you, when you go to public places, airports, restaurants, uh, shopping malls, grocery stores, you'll see people a lot of times with like a lab, you, they're usually, it's usually a Labrador, it's usually a German Shepherd. Um, they're usually wearing a vest, something that says do not pet, work, you know, at work. Um, these are dogs that are trained to work for one individual and they are specifically trained to do uh, a, a one task. Um, generally that, that task is to uh, provide assistance to somebody with a, a different types of disabilities. Um, so that could be something physical, like someone who is blind or someone who has, uh, who is hearing, has hearing impairment, um, someone that has seizures. Um, it also could be for, uh, an emotional type of disability, someone that has panic attacks or, uh, a, you know, out kind of behavioral outbursts. Um, but these dogs are bred specifically to do that, do that job. And they are assigned to a specific person to work for that specific person. They are not, you know, out in public to, to interact with other to, with the public and to make us all feel better. They are working. They are doing a specific job. Um, they are protected under uh, the ADA, um, meaning that they can go out in public places. Um, they can go on airplanes, public transportation, restaurants um, without needing permission from the, uh, you know, management owner um, because they are considered a tool for that person with that disability. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of training that goes into um, uh, training a service dog. Then you have uh, emotional support dogs. Um, and those are also a type of working dog, um, but with a little, less like specific training um, than a service dog. They are, they have, a, they have a, a specific task and they are meant to serve one person, um, but they don't have all the formal training that a service dog has. So 
um, someone that might has like an anxiety disorder or, a, you know, maybe has a fear of being in public places or a fear of flying, um, they may feel comforted by having their emotional support animal with them. Um, and they are able to take this emotional support animal out in public, um, on flights and stuff like that, so long as they have a, a letter from a uh, medical professional, a doctor, a psychiatrist, stating that, you know, they have this particular disorder and this dog is a support system for them to be able to function um, on an everyday basis. Um, emotional support animals are protected under the Fair Housing Authority Act, um, meaning that if you reside in an apartment living situation that's not animal friendly, you can still reside in that dwelling with this animal um, based on the, as long as you have that letter from your medical provider saying that it's required for you to have this support in order to live in the community. Um, however, emotional support dogs are not protected under ADA. Um, so it doesn't give uh, somebody with an emotional support animal automatic right to take that dog into a uh, Target or a Walmart or into a restaurant. Um, sometimes they may be allowed, sometimes not. It's at the discretion of that business or the owner or manager of that establishment. And then you have certified therapy dogs. <clears throat> and the base, the, the sole purpose of a therapy animal is to serve everybody around them. <laughs> um, so, you know, they have one handler, but their purpose is to bring joy to the people they are visiting. Um, you know, so they're similar to service dogs and emotional support dogs in the sense that they are serving a specific purpose, but they are different in that the, their main goal is to serve others, um, to, to bring benefit to other people. You know, they're not helping their handler with a specific symptom or disability. Um, they're helping others with a specific symptom, skill, disability. Um, therapy dogs generally are certified uh, through a recognized organization, usually on a national level, um, that usually provides the liability uh, sort of coverage that we need to be able to visit in places like hospitals and nursing homes and assisted living facilities. But therapy dogs are not protected under the ADA. Um, they're not protected under the Air Carriers Act or the Housing Authority Act, meaning that um, I can't just automatically take Abel on a plane because he's a therapy dog. Um, or if I live in an apartment that's not pet friendly, I can't um, get away with having him simply because he's a therapy dog. Um, the, the only thing that it, that certification therapy dog certification allows me to do is to take him on a scheduled visit supported by an organization for a very specific purpose, which is to provide a, you know, socialization, positive interaction, whatever. Um, you know, you might be able to take a therapy dog in some public places, um, that, you know, if you're not on a therapy visit, uh, but it, it's at the again at the discretion of the of the that establishment, the manager of that place that you are at. So I hope that kind of clarifies the the differences between the three. <laughs> Next slide. Maybe. Okay. So just a little bit of um, background about the history of animal assisted therapy. There's a lot. There's a lot of information about how the use of animals in a therapeutic setting came about, but not a whole lot of it is documented and some of it's kind of speculation. So I kind of tried to highlight the, the points in history that are well documented um, in the founding of animal assisted therapy. So um, the first noted documentation of any sort of use of animals in a therapeutic setting uh, was in uh, the 1700s at a mental health facility in York called The Retreat. Um, it was founded by uh, Quakers, and it was originally open to serve uh, the Quaker community, but it eventually um, opened up to serve everybody. And <clears throat> they kind of established this uh, idea of moral treatment 
which was like a more holistic approach to uh, mental health treatment. So, you know, rather than, um, you know, basically locking people up in psych hospitals for the remainders of their lives, um, the, this facility focused on rehabilitation through medication, through teaching, through uh, uh, hobbies, things like that. Um, they, the residents at this facility often engaged in uh, farm laboring, which involved tending to uh, animals. Um, and then these residents also had domesticated pets in the facility. And the people providing the care really noticed that this uh, sort of holistic approach was really beneficial for these people that were considered disturbed. Um, it was very calming for them. Um, it was a way for them to have some positive uh, socialization and a kind of a support system. Um, the next um, heavily documented uh, point in history that I could find as far as for animal assisted therapy was Florence Nightingale, who is well known in the nursing community as a pioneer for in nursing. Um, she, in her journals and papers and, and books, had several um, notes about how uh, patients that she had seemed to uh, respond very positively to interaction with small animals, particularly um, in psychiatric institutions where people were very uh, anxious or easily agitated or aggressive. Something about um, interacting with these animals, the, the co consistent petting, the sort of unconditional love that was, um, uh, you know, observed during an interaction, kind of non-judgmental. It was very calming and supportive for the people in these uh, environments. Mrs. Uh, Ms. Siggers is saying that where she is, I guess this is where she lives and, and works. Where I am, I see people all the time with their dogs everywhere, like TJ Maxx, Lowe's, Walmart, Kroger. I just figured they were service pets. Maybe they allow animals at these places. Thanks for explaining. Yeah, no problem. And um, they they might be they might not be service animals. They might just be emotional support animals. Um, sometimes I have a I have a hard time telling the the difference between the two uh, because um, you'll see a lot of people with emotional support pets wearing similar vests and collars and harnesses that service dogs do. So it's kind of hard to tell them apart. But if you watch the animals, <laughs> um, you know, if you observe them for a minute, you can usually tell in the training, um, usually, you know, emotionally support animals are basically like that person's pet, but they provide uh, another layer of uh, support and companionship than just a general house pet. Um, but they don't have the discipline and the the, the lengthy uh, in-depth training that a service dog does. So, you know, they may be well behaved. They may just sit in the cart just fine. Um, but usually they're sniffing around their environment. Their focus might not always be right on their owner. You know, they might try to interact with other people as they walk by. I mean, usually those that's kind of more of an emotional support animal, uh, a, a a genuine service dog is not going to be seeking interaction with people in the public because they're there they know that their job is supposed to be on their handler at all times you know they're typically going to be very quiet very calm i mean if you hadn't or hadn't seen the dog you probably wouldn't know it was there um and uh i, I do know that a lot of public places are becoming more open to people bringing their uh animals out in public and that's great for, you know, for me as a therapy pet handler and for people that are interested in doing that kind of work, because there's, we have to, we have to be able to condition these dogs to get ready to be therapy pets. And in order to do that, taking them to places like Kroger, Target, Walmart, Home Depot, Academy um, is great socialization and great desensitization. And for a long time, it was hard to find places that we could practice those things. And um, so when you see animals in public, they could be a service dog. They could be an emotional support dog. They could just be a, a, a pet that somebody's, you know, working on basic obedience 
socialization. Um, but if you kind of stand back and observe the handler and the, the dog, you can usually tell the difference. That's okay. fascinating. <laughs> you said they have like different color vest or unit. I mean, it's almost like hospital different color scrubs. Is it like that? I don't know if there are different colors based on what service the dog provides. Uh -huh. um, I, but I do know that uh, sometimes I'll go, if you go in public, you'll see a dog wearing a harness or a vest or something that says do not pet uh -huh. or at work or um, working dog or something. And you think, oh, that's a service dog, but it could actually just be an emotional support animal. Right. Uh, but if you step back and kind of observe how that dog behaves, you can probably tell the difference between yeah. whether it's a service dog or, where it, or whether it's an emotional support animal or whether it's just somebody's pet that they're trying to, you know, work on obedience or, you know, just work on socialization. Um, hope that answers that question. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I would say that <laughs> my dog, I was laughing, thinking about taking my dog in like Kroger. I mean, all the aisles would be just crashing down like dominoes very shortly after we arrived. Yeah. And uh, Rachel had a good, uh, ADA does not require a vest for service dogs, but it's helpful for them to wear one to identify as a service dog. Yeah. Because if you take that dog into a public place that doesn't usually allow animals, you know, you can say, well, my dog is a service animal, therefore it's protected under ADA and therefore is allowed to be in this place with me, whether you like it or not. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so going back to a little bit more about the history. Um, so in the 1930s, Freud, we all know Sigmund Freud, um, oddly enough, had a chow named Joffy, which uh, if you know the chow breed, I wouldn't think of as a chow as being a, a, a really good therapy animal, but um, it's Freud, so who knows? Um, <laughs> but um, in the anyway, Freud found that having Joffe um, present in his therapy sessions seemed to be very beneficial for his clients, uh, particularly in the initial uh, phase, stages of treatment, and particularly in children. Um, he noticed that a lot of patients preferred to use the dog um, as sort of a stepping stone. To, for communication in the initial stages of treatment. They felt more, commu more comfortable communicating through Joffe than directly to uh, Freud. Um, and Freud also noticed he could sense a patient's level of tension during a session based on what his dog was doing. So if his dog stayed at the other end of the room and seemed apprehensive about interacting with the client, then Freud knew that the client was not exactly comfortable or was somewhat tense. But if Joffe stayed close by to the client and seemed relaxed and calm and, and was seeking, a, you know, petting from the client, then, that, then Freud knew that the client was, you know, calm and comfortable and feeling good in the session. Um, so, you know, Freud, Freud using animals in his practice was pretty common. He did it a lot, um, but nobody really knew about it until like two decades after his death when his journals and papers started being translated. Um, so, you know, no one really knew that was, they weren't able to learn about the benefits of, of animal interaction during Freud's time until, you know, 20 years later. Um, so then in the, in the 1960s, there was a man named Dr. Levinson, and he had a client, it was, a, I believe, a nine-year-old boy who was nonverbal and had some type of either trauma or a significant severe mental illness, anyway, nonverbal. And he was in a session with this client one day. He walked out of the room and left his dog Jingles in the room, not thinking anything about it. And when he came back, he observed this nonverbal child petting Jingles and talking to him. And he was stunned. And then he started, he, he kept Jingles around and he started to monitor other clients and their interactions with Jingles. And he started to uh, recognize that um, 
children really seem to have positive benefits from interacting with animals during therapy. And he presented this information um, in a paper to the American Psychological Association. And initially it wasn't really well received, but as Freud's work started to be translated and started to be studied and discussed, then Dr. Levinson's paper became, uh, people were more interested by that. Um, and atten more attention started being paid to animal assisted therapy. And uh, he's Dr. Levinson, he's sort of known as the father of animal assisted therapy because it kind of started, kind of started with him. Freud deserves some credit, but his credit comes at the same time as Dr. Levinson. So <laughs> and next slide. Um, also in the 1960s, um, there was a man named Dr. Lawrence. Um, he was a physiologist and a zoologist, and he was known for doing, uh, bringing a lot of modern techniques to an the study of animal behavior. And uh, he, his, the work that he did with doing animal behavior and the work that Dr. Levinson did, their philosophies kind of developed the idea of this um, human animal bond. Basically what they found in their work was that human beings uh, appeared to um, have this intrinsic need for a bond with nature. Uh, in the chaos that is the human life, being able to interact with an animal sort of provided a grounding opportunity uh, for people. Um, bonding with nature was sort they saw it as sort of a foundation of being a human being that people needed in order to address the chaos in their lives. Um, and so the, the their work as it um, was discussed and studied, and it had gained media coverage, um, their philosophies began to be referred to as this idea of the human-animal bond. Um, and that kind of led to studies about animal-assisted activities, the benefits of, you know, incorporating animals in therapeutic practice, and therapy dog programs. So when um, the idea of the human animal bond was established, um, that you know people started becoming more interested. Um, how how can we use animals to benefit people with with a variety of needs? Um, that led to the forming of an at least in the United States, the forming of a of the organization called Delta Society, which is now known as Pet Partners. Um, but Delta Society. Um, is really like the the, the go-to uh, organization on a national level um, for animal assisted therapy um, and cert therapy dog certification programs. It was founded uh, in 1981 um, by a man named Dr. Bustad, um, who was a veterinarian. And the interesting thing about animal assisted therapy and the Delta Society at this point is that um, it was really the people that were driving the founding of this organization, it was a multidisciplinary approach. So you had veterinarians, you had, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists, you had people that worked in like animal, the animal care industry, um, things that people that did things like with dog food and animal health. It was really interesting. Um, oh, I'm running out of breath. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, Dr. Bustad became the president um, of the Delta Society. And uh, depending on what article you read, he's credited with, with um, developing the term human animal bond. Um, but I think he really just was the cherry on top of the cake as far as bringing attention to um, doctors Levinson and Lawrence and all of the work that they did and bringing it into a cohesive, uh, or, you know, organization. Um, Delta Society was responsible for forming task forces um, that promoted the human animal bond and supported uh, research projects in order to find, in order to um, invest in more like empirical findings and data on the benefits of animal assisted therapy. 
And it was also responsible for developing sort of the standard for uh, therapy dog, therapy pet certification programs. And I would, I would argue that they, that they kind of still set that standard today. Uh, I mean, since I've been involved in the field, um, Pet Partners is always, I've always gotten the impression that it's kind of the, that's the, it's the go-to. You go to their website, they've got a ton of information. They actually provide some certifications of their own, um, not only for therapy pet handlers, but for healthcare professionals that are interested in incorporating uh, animal assisted therapy into their practice. It's, it's really, it's, they've got a lot, it's a, we got a plethora of information on the website. Um, but Delta Society was also <clears throat> um, influential in uh, establishing other therapy pet organizations throughout the world. Um, so it's a very important organization. <clears throat> okay, so um, a lot of times when you hear discussions on animal assisted whatever, you always hear people say animal assisted therapy, um, but animal assisted therapy is, is actually a specific type of animal assisted intervention. And animal assisted intervention is really the more appropriate umbrella term. Um, and an animal assisted intervention, um, it's basically a goal directed task where an animal is made part of a person's treatment plan, or treatment activities, um, it's goal driven and it's, it becomes an integral part of, a, of the treatment process. Um, these interventions are usually led by um, some type of healthcare professional, social worker, counselor, nurse, physical therapist, physician. Um, but it can also be delivered by people that have certain certification to provide this service. And, you know, Despite the fact that there are several different types of animal assisted intervention, the overall goal with all of them is to improve um, physical and so social and emotional well being. Ultimately, that's the main goal. Um, so, animal assisted therapy being, you know, probably the most well known term as far as interventions go, this is a gold, goal directed intervention that is provided by a healthcare professional. Um, working within the scope of his or her profession. So like a physical therapist working with somebody in a rehab setting who's relearning how to walk may incorporate uh, a dog into their, you know, physical therapy sessions, may have the client practice, you know, walking by walking the dog down a hallway. Um, that, that, that's uh, an example of animal assisted therapy. Um, it can be group or individual in nature, um, but the difference between animal assisted or what sets animal assisted therapy apart is that it's the progress is usually documented on, it's part of a treatment plan and it's evaluated um, by a facilitator or a provider. Then you have animal assisted activities um, that are a little, they're not as goal driven, um, goals based as animal assisted therapy, but they provide opportunities for, you know, improving, increasing socialization, improving overall well-being. Um, they also provide good educational opportunities. They can also be delivered in a variety of environments. Um, they, they don't have to be provided by, um, you know, a, a healthcare provider. They can be provided by a volunteer who's trained to provide that activity. Can, can you share or type into the chat room the uh, website for the Pet Partners Delta Society? I can. Let me find it. And then, um, so I just want to be clear. So the difference in, in, in animal-assisted therapy versus any other animal-assisted intervention is that the therapy is actually documented. Is that, I mean, it's documented and performed by a clinician? Yes. Okay. So. Um, for, for example, um, like with hand and paw, you know, one of the things that uh, one visit I might go on is um, to, I might take Able to the cancer center here at D, the Manderson Cancer Center here at DCH, and I might let him interact with people while they're receiving chemotherapy. Um, 
that would be more of an example of animal of an animal assisted activity um, because it's just general um, interaction. There's it's not um, there's no specific goal for it other than to provide a positive experience while this person is receiving uh, chemotherapy. Got you. Um, but then like animal assisted therapy, you might, uh, what would be an example? Um, if, a, if a social worker is providing individual therapy to um, a, a, a teenager that has been through some sort of trauma or abuse, Right. Um, yeah. It might, you know, they might be able to set some specific goal, like, you know, uh, the the patient will be able to discuss the traumatic event for at least, you know, 15 minutes of one therapy session without becoming increasingly agitated. And they might, the, the social worker might use the dog as a tool to uh -huh. meet that specific objective. Got you. Does that make sense? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Sense. And <laughs> okay. then Melanie Lane asked, and you can, I'm sure you know, how are uh, how is this used in prisons or jails? Well, as a hand and paw volunteer, I haven't actually um, I haven't ever actually taken my therapy pets to a jail or prison since I've since I've been with hand and paw. I don't think um, we've ever had a, 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 a partnership with a county jail or a prison system, but it would absolutely be beneficial. I, I did, um, when I use, I worked at Taylor Harden Secure Medical Facility for several years and um, I had the opportunity to take my therapy dog at that time to visit with people. And uh, it, it was, it was very beneficial. Um, I know that that's not necessarily a correctional setting but dealing with the forensic population um i've we also here in tuscaloosa we take our pets to or our therapy dogs to a place called the wow program which is a rehabilitative program for female juvenile offenders so again it's not um, a jail setting or a prison setting um, but these are individuals that are uh, in the correctional system um, and typically, um, we use, we do sort of general animal assisted activities, which are just these kind of wellness visits, just a, just an opportunity to provide, a, a, you know, a chance to get your mind off of whatever stressing you out, to encourage positive socialization, um, to sort of create opportunity for maybe some trust or some rapport with the people in these correctional environments. Um, but uh, we also provide programming, which I'll get to later in this uh, presentation, uh, pro programming um, that is, we use, utilize the animals to uh, reinforce positive social skills, life skills, responsibility, and um, to uh, sort of modify behaviors. So I guess the, the short answer to that question is, um, I think therapy animals can be used in a correctional environment as a stress reliever, but also as a way to modify uh, behaviors, um, as a way to provide sort of kind of trauma rehabilitation and counseling. I just, I don't think it's, it's used as much as it should be. And there are some states that actually use therapy dogs in during court hearings. For example, um, let's say a, a child has to testify against someone that's alleged to have abused them. Um, you know, that's a lot, it's very difficult, but they have found that if they have a therapy dog present during the hearing, if the child is able to focus on that therapy animal while providing testimony, then it's a little less traumatic for them. So that's another example of how a therapy animal can be utilized in sort of a correctional setting or environment. Fascinating. Um, <clears throat> and then animal assisted education, that's kind of like a, um, for, I'll get into this later in the presentation, but um, using therapy animals as a way to promote um, uh, like 
literacy, improve reading skills, improve uh, a, a child's ability to stay in a learning environment. Um, and then uh, residential animals. An example of this, I did my uh, master's level field placement at the Tuscaloosa VA. And there were, I think at the time, two dogs that were owned by the Tuscaloosa VA Medical Center um, that their, their sole purpose was to attend um, like group sessions and to provide uh, sort of therapeutic support uh, for veterans that were in like PTSD support groups or substance abuse groups. I know that the handlers would take these dogs to like treatment team meetings so that the veteran, you know, had sort of a non judgmental support system um, while they were di discussing uh, stressful treatment issues. Um, so that's just, those are the four main types of animal assisted interventions. Man, I thought I wasn't going to have enough <laughs> information. It's yeah, it's 1250. I'm putting the, the password in now for the, uh, for the uh, thing. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, so I'll just try to go through this as quickly as I can. Um, so so some, some, some of the uh, benefits of animal-assisted therapy or interventions, um, the big ones for physical health, they have seen a uh, positive impact on cardiovascular symptoms, lowering blood pressure and heart rate. Um, they've also noticed, also observed that it lowers cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Um, as far as uh, lung function, it improves breathing, um, nervous system response, immune system function. And um, for children, it can also reduce the risk of developing allergies or asthma later in life, exposure to animals. Um, as far as emotional benefits, um, animal interaction promotes positive socialization. It provides distraction. It provides- AP, Or APY. Involved with Gallery, Alabama by downloading the WBFC News app. One body is uh, bleeding over. I think we just need to, yeah. I Sorry. to shut them off. South American river turtles. Um, so emotional effects, reducing anxiety, depression, protecting against loneliness and isolation, uh, providing a sense of uh, a purpose and safety and companionship. Um, when you look up articles, um, when you look up articles on animal assisted therapy, a lot of times the diagnoses that are highlighted are things like Alzheimer's disease, anxiety, depression, cancer, cardiovascular uh, issues, uh, and then autism spectrum disorder when you're reading stuff about children and intellectual disabilities. Um, so what are the qualities of a potential therapy dog? Um, basically think of just any, any friendly dog you see on the street, um, a dog that seeks interaction with other people, enjoys being petted by strangers, doesn't mind being petted in odd places, doesn't mind loud noises, sudden movements, enjoys going out in public and, and meeting with new people, is not, um, is not intimidated by strange environments, um, and has a calm demeanor and is, a train, and is trainable. Next slide. Um, so this training process, this is this information is sort of hand and paw specific, but we get our um, sort of training process from uh, ITA, which is Intermountain Therapy Animals, which and then Pet Partners. So it, the training process is generally similar across all pet, therapy pet organizations. But for hand and paw, the animal has to be the animal has to be at least two years old. You have to have owned the dog for at least six months. And they have to have completed a basic obedience course. Um, and we, they have to be up to date on all their vaccinations and flea and tick and heartworm prevention and not have any health issues that require them to be on like antibiotic or antifungal medication during visitation because it's an infection control thing. Um, when you sign up to train to become a therapy team, 
um, you have, will have completed that basic obedience class. Um, you know, Hand and Paw will do an initial interview to meet your dog. We will screen your dog for its, you know, basic obedience skills and temperament. Um, if your dog is accepted into the training program, there are several workshops where we focus on, we focus on obedience, um, but really what we have seen is usually the dogs have the obedience part down. It's the working, working on the human, <laughs> working on the handler and practicing different types of scenarios that you might run into in the field. Um, and then once those workshop sessions are completed, there is an evaluation. Um, and if you pass the evaluation, there's a new team orientation. Uh, next slide, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I keep, you can go back to that, that, that the slide with the pictures. I just, I also wanna emphasize, I keep saying dogs, and usually dogs <clears throat> are the are the most commonly seen therapy animal because they're easily trained and and you know very they very much seek uh, human interaction. Um, but you can also have miniature miniature horses are very popular. Cats are very popular. You'll see that picture of me and my cat Akira. Um, for a while, we had a couple of goats in the program. Um, if you look up animal assisted therapy videos on YouTube, there's a great video, um, I almost included it, but a great video of a horse. He's actually a stallion. The cl first clip in the video is, is of him galloping across a field, but then the next clip is of him walking down a hallway in a nursing home. And wow. the video explains how he, how in a nurse, when he's at work as a therapy horse, he's a completely different animal. He's very calm, um, very patient. And they let him pick the rooms that he wants to go into. And he always picks the rooms that where the person is struggling the most, whether it's somebody that's dying or maybe, you know, something kind of traumatic. It's really a touching video. Anyway, I just like to share that. My mushy animal pictures. <clears throat> you, you can go on to the next slide. I know we're kind of running out of time. Um, if, if, if at any point you, you guys are interested in either becoming a therapy pet handler or, or just kind of learning more about the training process, um, you can go to Hand in Paw's website. It's handinpaw.org. And all of this information as far as how to train your you and how to train your, your pet to, to prepare for therapy work, all that information is on there. Oh, next slide, sorry. <laughs> Um, and just a little bit um, about hand and paw. Um, if you guys work in, a, in an agency, an environment that you think would benefit from um, therapy animals coming to visit, we are always seeking um, to establish new community partners. Um, that information is on the website as well. We provide a variety of programs. And this is just a little bit of information about you know, the services we do provide. Um, hip cares, um, that is sort of like uh, the uh, animal assisted therapy, um, sort of like the group that I was referring to that was with at-risk youth um, promoting positive socialization and anger management. Um, hip heals, those are uh, sort of like our physical therapy, occupational therapy type visits, and then hip reads. Those are the literacy programs where um, we will visit a school, a classroom at a school, and each student in the classroom will be paired with a, an animal, and they will practice reading to the animal, and it promotes confidence, boosts self-esteem, and um, improves literacy. Next slide. <clears throat> um, and these are just some of the places that Hand and Ball currently visits. Um, we visit uh, multiple departments at UAB, Children's, and DCH Regional Medical Center. Um, we visit uh, Glenwood. I was trying, most, most of our services are in the Birmingham and those surrounding areas and then Tuscaloosa. Uh, but we visit with children, with the elderly. We do WAGS to wellness visits, which is visiting um, people at different banks, stores, different types of businesses. Um, like I said, like I've said this whole presentation, I mean, animals are beneficial for everyone. Doesn't matter what age, 
what problem, what environment um, in hand and paw is always willing to help as we can and services are free of charge. Um, so that's another great resource. I know as a social worker working here and always trying to keep an eye out. Um, so please always keep that in mind if you think that hand and paw could be of assistance. And I think that's all I have. <laughs> the next well, subject, a bunch of pictures. <laughs> Oh, do we have more pictures? Oh, there we go. That was excellent. I you I had said at the beginning of this that you were the first of our listeners to um you know offer to to do a presentation, but we've had many guests that we approached, and you really are one of the best speakers we've ever had, Holly. I'm so oh, really <laughs> so impressed and so oh, grateful. I'm gonna encourage you publicly to speak more often and create some other topics of interest to you, which this this topic so clearly is of interest to you that you'd like to share with others. We'd love to have you back and do okay. other things. Great. I, I can think of something. <laughs> well, well, let me know. It's a standing invitation, and I mean that. Just even I appreciate time. that. Um, someone says they love the llama, I guess, in the oh, yeah. path. Are there four? No, are there more? No. That's uh, it. Oh, yeah, I don't, yeah. No, it's just the the man looking up at the llama. Um, well, my you know. my wife has been wanting for years for me to get a goat, which I don't think we have enough room for a goat, and I'm a little <laughs> afraid of goats because their pupils are rectangles. I don't know if you know this, but it's a little frightening <laughs> to look a goat in the eye. And uh, so I've resisted goat. Then she wanted miniature horses, which I know we don't have room. From miniature <laughs> horses, and but, but I, I Sean, look at this. Have all of the above. Look at this picture. There's a miniature horse in this nursing home or assisted living facility, and he fits perfectly. I see, and he's bigger that than the one she's looking at. <laughs> that he's almost like what my grandfather used to call a Shetland pony. Oh yeah. But uh, the miniature horses, I mean, are about really the size of a lab, I guess. Um, yeah. And but even. I don't know. If anything, I, I sort of like the fainting goat. It's probably my favorite animal. Uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to point out some of these pictures, um, like in the bottom left-hand corner, the little boy brushing the boxer. That would be an example of um, using uh, animals in a kind of an occupational therapy setting. They're use, uh, practicing sort of fine motor skills, the brushing uh, cord brushing of the dog helps that little boy to practice uh, kind of hand-eye movement, hand-eye coordination. You have the next to him, the little girl who's um, walking the dog blindfolded. Um, you know, she's, I guess that's kind of like physical therapy. Um, the man next to her who's balancing on that ball and the dog is pulling the <laughs> rope toy. I imagine that's some kind of core stability, core strengthening that he's doing uh, in the presence of a physical therapist. So those would be examples of animal assisted therapy. Whereas the ones above them, the llama and the doodle with the lady in bed, the miniature horse, those would be examples of animal assisted activities. You know, just a general uh, interaction. So you, I, I <laughs> wanted to read, you've got great presentation. You were wonderful. Hand and Paul visited Princeton when I worked there. The most meaningful visit was a dog comforting young children of mm -hmm. a hospice patient. The entire unit cried that day. Yes. Uh, um, oops, I'm having trouble getting uh, if I, mood, but If I had more time, I would share, uh, you know, stories um, about, you know, just my experiences taking my own animals into places. I mean, I've had similar experiences of interacting with people in a hospice setting that were nonverbal. They pet a dog for 15 minutes and all of a sudden they turn to me and speak. I'm like, oh, you know, um, I, at the WOW program, I mean, I've been able to establish rapport with those residents to the point where some, I had an incident where one student um, disclosed some suicidal thoughts that she was having and she was about to be discharged and hadn't told anybody. And you know, because she felt comfortable with me and my pet in disclosing that, we were actually able to help her in the long run. I mean, there's just all kinds of testimonials out there. I mean, it's 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 a wonderful resource. It really is. And um, I really encourage everybody to look into it, you know, whether it's 
you know, with hand and paw, or you can go on pet partners and look for individuals that are certified in the community or in your area. Um, you know, please, you know, just research it, see if it's something that could be useful to you. Well, it's certainly, we appreciate your interest in it and the utility of it that you brought to others. We're a good bit past our hour. I'm uh, no, I'm sorry. I'll shut up. Thank <laughs> you again, Holly. You did a great job and we could talk all day. I hope those of you on the line will join us on Monday. We have Phyllis Grower, who's a noted hospice pharmacist, who will be talking about uh, pain relief for the elderly. That will be interesting. And then we have other good presentations throughout the month that you can find on carepatrol.com under my landing page. My name is Sean Barnes. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll copy Holly on the email with certificate so y'all can reach out to her. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. All right, bye. Bye. If I, can, I never can get this to work either. <laughs> and, and, and. See, it, it disappears before you can get it to end. So frustrating. I don't see anything having disappeared. Yeah, and so like I'm here looking frantic on this thing and feeling foolish and I can't, can't get it to work. So let's see. See what else we can do. Well, y'all that are here, you can drop off.